happy with you tonight on the program as we continue our study in the book of Corinthians. We'll be in chapter 11 and hopefully get through with the chapter tonight as we'll start with uh, verse 17 of chapter 11. Uh, tonight's uh, program, as Paul was dealing with the Corinthian church, will deal with church gatherings and coming together and specifically the Lord's Supper. Something that, once again, we would figure would be a very simple matter for churches to organize. You have the body of Christ, supposedly. You have brethren in that body that as Christ loved us, we love one another. Or at least it's supposed to be that way. It seems that gathering together would be a very simple matter. But once again, as we've explained now over 11 chapters, there is nothing simple or easy whenever it comes to the faith being worked at this church in Corinth. From chapter 1 all the way to chapter 11 now, we have seen that everything they have done, Paul has had to condemn them. In every single thing they do, Paul has had to chastise them. As I said at the very beginning of the teaching of the book of Corinthians, this is a church that cannot get anything right. Now, there is a reason that this is important. Because it is the motive, the intent, the purpose, the reason that we do anything that truly matters. What is behind it? There are physical acts in the world, but there are spiritual principles behind those acts. There are physical wars that break out in the world, as we see clearly from the book of Daniel. But the wars are actually being fought in the heavenly places. And what's happening on the earth is a manifestation of what's happening in that heavenly realm or that above us. Where demonic activity is at war with the principles of light. And it causes war here on the earth because some people are led by demons and other people are not. So something as simple as coming together in the church is something that the elite brain that operates at Corinth simply cannot pull off. Once again, it started out in chapter 1 with divisions. And here in chapter 11, it's still divisions. And the passage that we keep coming back to that becomes the root of all things, is Paul said to this church, I cannot speak to you as spiritual, but I have to speak to you as carnal, as babes. This is what the problem is at Corinth and what the problem will be with you and with me and with anything we do. If we do not mature and if we do not develop spiritually, you will not develop if you do not develop mentally, and you cannot mentally properly develop, if you do not spiritually develop, it is the spirit that is in contact with and in touch with what is the source of true knowledge. It is the spirit that is in contact with what is the source of true wisdom. That is God. For the beginning, the Bible says, of all wisdom and all knowledge, the Bible says, is the fear of God. Absent of that, you have no true knowledge. Without true knowledge, you cannot properly develop. Without true wisdom, you cannot properly develop as a human being. There are many today that's 35, 40 years old and still locked in the frame of a 12-year-old or an 11-year-old mentally. They've never developed. They've never matured. Spiritually speaking, as I was saying a minute ago, there's always something behind what's going on. And the reason that the church of Corinth could not pull anything off successfully, even as simple now as a church gathering and the partaking of the Lord's Supper, is because all they had in heart, all they had in mind, one, was servicing the God of which Paul said was their bellies. In other words, they were people of appetite. We have already talked in almost every program, at least some, about this elitist attitude that was in there, about this, about this high-minded carnality, uh, probably secularly educated, maybe very much so. Because it appears that they love eloquence. 
They don't care about the word. They don't care about the judgment of God. But they like people who are worldly smart. But these worldly smart people can't run a world. And they certainly cannot run a church. It has to be spiritually based. So Paul is telling us what the problem is at the root. These are not spiritual people. They have a church, but they are as backslid as it can possibly be. And whenever they come together, it is my clique and your clique. It is the rich folks and the intelligent folks, the schooled people, the ones with diplomas that gather over here amongst themselves, the people who has, and it is the people that's without or poor or less intelligent that's over there because these rich elite brains feels that they're, well, they're above that class of people. But see, whenever it comes to the house of God, we are not above anybody. And we must understand that. As we compare ourselves man to man, human to human, some of us can excel more than others. Some of us may be classified better people. But when we come and stand before God, what I'm judging myself against is not another marred and scarred human being of flesh, blood, and bone. When I come before God, and that is the house of God, I am now standing in the presence of God. And trust me, when any of us stand in the presence of God, God, you know, the one that's got the key to all the closets. When we stand before the righteousness of God, none of us can be seen nor viewed as better than the other one. Not when it's all pulled out. Not when it's all brought to the level. We are all the same. We are fallen. There is none righteous. No, not one. There is none, God said, that seeketh after me. We're all in the same boat. This is why I've told you, as I'll read to you in a few minutes, I've told you when we enter into the house of God, we should do better than we are in our own homes. I've told you there's things that I will do in my house, of which will be confirmed in a minute. Things I'll allow to be done in my house that I would never allow to be done in the church. As I brought to your attention last week, that's not hypocriting. That is reverence. We all, if we have any civility at all, all of us acts better and demands our children act with better manners when we go into somebody else's house. It's just civility. But when we go into the house of God, how much more should we put on our best, to be our best, to understand there is a oneness of this body. And if you make a quarter of a million dollars a year, and this one over here is making 8,000 a year or 12,000 a year, you're no better than that person. And you're not a true Christian until you are able to at one mingle with other Christians. I'm not talking about outside of Christianity but mingle with other Christians, no matter what state they're in, no matter what condition they are financially, until you are able to mingle with them in the love of the brotherhood and oneness of the body of Christ, you're either a backslidden Christian, an extremely flawed Christian, or not a Christian at all. We simply don't pull rank, see rank in the house of God because every one of us knows our own personal, woeful condition as we stand before the Almighty. Now, beginning with verse 17, Paul says this, as we are now moving into the Corinthians, these know-alls, the Corinthian church is fixing, fixing to attempt to have a church gathering. They're fixing to attempt to partake in the Lord's Supper. Let's see how this well-educated, highly esteemed bunch can mess that up. Verse 17. Verse 17 says, Now in this I declare unto you, Paul says, I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. First of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I partly believe it. Okay, so what in this particular case is causing the divisions? Well, the next verse begins to make it clear. The Bible tells us in verse 20, 21. 
For in eating, every one taketh before another his own supper. One is hungry, and another is drunken. Paul asked, What? Have ye not houses to eat and drink in? Or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. So what they was doing was they was going to have the Lord's Supper. But every man brought his own food. Well, now the partaking of the Lord's Supper was that the disciples ate of the same bread and they drank of the same cup. Clearly written, clearly established. Do this in remembrance of me, Jesus said. Those that gathered at the table at what we call and know to be the Lord's Supper, they ate from the same bread and they drank from the same cup. But here at Corinth, they liked to divide things. So the wealthy and the rich, the highly esteemed, as we've spoke of many times, brings their own food, pots and pots of food. The purpose here is, as the partaking of the Lord's Supper, is to do something in remembrance of the Lord Jesus, his life and his death, the bread, his body, the wine, his blood. But this bunch brings plates of food. They can't separate between a church gathering and a church picnic and the participating in the Lord's Supper. So you have people who have not, who are being shamed now. Because over on this side of the church, you are literally having a feast. On the other side of the church, Barely got enough to, to eat. Now listen, understand this. The point of which I'm making here, I'm not in any way, shape, form, or fashion trying to show this division between the rich and the poor. Understand, understand plainly. Poor people are just as greedy, just as selfish, just as envious, and just as evil as rich people. It's just that rich people has material of which they can be envious with, and the poor people don't have as much of that material. But the spirit, the root of it is the same. Poor people can be killers. Rich people can be killers. Rich people can be greedy. Poor people can be greedy. I've met a many of them. This is not about that. This is about the church of God. And again, me telling you that we can do things at my house that we're not going to do in the church purely out of reverence. We can watch a football game at my house, but we're not going to go put a big screen TV in the church, the house of God, and watch football there. Because I understand that the Bible commands that we separate the common from the holy. That's reverence. It's respect. Likewise, here, Paul is saying, you have houses to eat in, and you have houses to drink in. Now, the wine that was brought was obviously real wine, because they was eating, and they were drunken, Paul said. And then Paul said, can you not eat and drink at your own house? not in the house of God. Here it is supposed to be unity. But in order for there to be unity, there has to be oneness. In order for the church and for the body of Christ to exercise oneness, we have to understand we are not separate bodies as the household of faith. We are one body. We are the body of Christ. That's why we do not divide and separate ourselves. This is why there should be some forethought. If we're going to bring potluck dinners and have big gatherings for dinner at, at the church, we should make sure that there's enough for everybody to eat equally. Not gather up in one corner with the rich and the high to-dos and the others over there just with much of nothing, shaming them. And that in the house of God. But here's what they were doing. Now, another thing now that becomes very important. As I've told you, it is important to understand the art of studying the Bible. And this is a question and something that is asked by multitudes of people all through the years, and even here recently. How do you study the Bible? 
And that is a reasonable request because you need to get all out of it, all, all of it that you can, you need to get out of it. How do I study the Bible? Okay, we're fixing to go now into about six passages of Scripture where Paul starts speaking concerning the Lord's Supper, that we should partake of it worthily, that uh, many who have partaken of it unworthily are now dead. He uses the word asleep. Some are sick. It's, it's, it's uh, to be taken with a right mindset. Now, we can leave right now the teaching of which we have done now for 11 weeks or more. The teaching of the book of Corinthians where we are focused on what the church was doing, what the church's problems was, and what was being done about it. We can now leave that very easy to go into these next verses from verse 24 to I think verse 30. We can go into these next verses and now get off on the Lord's Supper. All right, now the teaching of the Lord's Supper, what it is and what it's for, is important. But the study right now is not the Lord's Supper. It is the condition of this church and why this church is in this condition. And the fact that nothing of which they attempt to do as a single body of Christ ever works. So, what we can't allow ourselves to do now is to take these next few verses and get off on a study of the Lord's Supper. We will do that later. When we do deal with the Lord's Supper, we will take all of what the Bible said about it in other books, and other chapters, include these verses, and we will come to a well-rounded understanding of what the Lord's Supper is. But if we want to continue the flow here, then we can't go off on the Lord's Supper. The point is very simple here. They were attempting to have the Lord's Supper at Corinth and messed it up. A simple church gathering, they messed it up. Why? Because there is no spirit in the place, notwithstanding that there are some in there that's saved, but as a whole, and that that's running the church. These people are not one, and they're not one because they are carnal. If they are truly born again, they are babies in Christ running the show, and it simply cannot be. So in verse 31, after Paul had condemned them for abusing the Lord's Supper, he tells us, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home that ye come not together unto condemnation, and the rest I will set in order when I come. So Paul is telling the church here that whenever you eat, and if you want to eat, if you want to fill your bellies, if you want to eat, do it at home. Meaning, very simple. This is not a church gathering where we're all eating. All come to eat, provide for everybody. This is the partaking of the Lord's Supper. Paul gives you clear instructions of it. He tells you what it's all about. Then he tells the church, to judge yourselves what is going on. If there is maturity, if there is spirituality, if there is Bible, you can perform a righteous judgment. And that righteous judgment is not just my judging other people, but it's vitally important, Paul is saying, that you be able to judge yourself. And by the same means of which you judge others is the same means of which you judge yourself. So the Bible says, that we have the right to judge. And in fact, the fact of the business is you ain't going to be alive long if you don't judge. Everybody judges. Even the ones who saying don't judge me are judging you for judging them. Everybody judges. Everybody has to. What the Lord said was to judge a righteous judgment. And how do you judge a righteous judgment? Because it is a biblical judgment. For an example, if I were to say that an atheist is a fool then that is not my judgment. That is God's judgment. I happen to believe that God is true. And what I've seen from atheists, the fact that they are fools is supported by what they do and what the Bible says. The Bible says that a fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Paul is telling them, look, judge these matters. And he said it in earlier chapters. Judge these matters among yourselves. 
He said, even the children has better sense than you do. If you can't judge these matters, as he spoke earlier, if you can't judge these matters that are so clear, he said, let the babies do it. Paul has condemned this church from chapter 1 to the chapter that we're in now. He's simply saying to judge yourselves. And if we will judge ourselves, we won't have to be judged. It's just that simple. Almost all of the people of the Bible, almost all of the great men of the Bible, the Bible showed some place or the other that they failed, they messed up. David, Peter, all of them. At some point or the other, Samson, all of them showed where they made a mistake, messed up. The only one that you have any detailed writings from and about that nothing was ever shown on him as dirt was Daniel. And I believe that the mindset of which Daniel had in a particular statement that he made, as Israel had sinned, as judgment had fallen, Daniel had cried out against it. But whenever the conquering took place of Babylon conquering Israel, Daniel did not stand up and say, you have sinned, you are rotten, you are devils. Daniel stood up and said, we have sinned against the Lord. You see, if you judge yourself, Paul is saying, you won't have to be judged. But if you don't, then God will judge you. Especially if you are a Christian. To all that call themselves the children of God, the sons of God, the Bible said they are chastened of the Lord. And in this verse that we just read, if God judges you, the Bible says God will chasten you. Paul is simply trying to set order in this church in everything that he's done. When he spoke about the terrible sin in chapter 4, chapter 5, where a man was having incest in the church, going unjudged. Paul said, judge these things in yourself. One of the Bible was telling us as Paul was speaking concerning the other sins at Corinth, Paul was saying, the purpose of judgment is to right the ship and bring peace into the house. When Paul talk, talked about unbelievers being married to believers, he said, if the unbeliever wants to stay, let them stay. This is for the peace of the church. If the unbeliever wishes to depart, let them go, for you are not under the bondage in such cases. What we are to establish in the house of God is peace. But listen, we can't establish this peace in the house of God by forsaking the judgment of the word of God. This is what so many churches are doing today to keep everybody happy and everybody satisfied because you've went out and drawn into your church with all kind of games and all kind of clubs and all kind of entertainments. You've drawn in some of everything in this world who still sits in that congregation in that church unsaved. And so now the preachers of the churches today coddles the unsaved and to stop from causing them any trouble or breaking the unity of the church up, we don't preach the Bible anymore because if I say this, what the Bible says and teaches, it's going to condemn that brother or sister. So all we do is just say, Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. Let's go and eat and watch the next movie. That's the state of the church today. It is really no better off today than it was at Corinth. Paul is pointing out to us the conditions we should see them. The main thing is, is that we must understand that we are not a separate body. When we enter into the house of God, when we are born again, truly born again, everyone around us that has truly been born again is not of a separate body than us, but is of the same body. And what we do is we gather, being begotten, the Bible said, that means we was birthed whenever we were reborn, born again. We were birthed of the word. The Bible says we was begotten by the word. In it, there's exhortation. In it, there's chastening. And we have to accept it all. We've got all kind of churches today that cater to all kind of people today. 
We got uh, motorcycle churches. We got cowboy churches. We got rock churches. We got rap churches. What we are in desperate need of right now, for real, is Bible churches. <music> Thank you. 